So the next talker, uh, speaker, I guess, that we have coming up is Theo Clark, and he, uh, he's a very hard-working skeptic and uh, has a podcast that he's just started doing again and uh, a new version of the Skeptic Field Guide. Uh, you might have heard him on the Skeptic Zone recently being interviewed about it, and uh, he's sure to provide us with a fascinating talk. So give it up, please, for Theo Clark. Okay, thank you. Um, so in my talk today, uh, what I want to look at is some uh, issues around um, claims people make about how the brain works, and in particular, how they might apply that into education. So my background, uh, for those of you who um, don't know me, my background is as a secondary mathematics, uh, science, physics teacher. Uh, and I currently now work in curriculum and assessment in the, at the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority uh, for the Queensland Government. Also, a little caveat, obviously anything I do say today are my own views and do not reflect that of my employer. Um, <laughs> this is actually a bit of a talk I gave uh, at the then QSA, as we were known back then. Uh, when we had a, a day, one of the, my colleagues who was quite interested in neuroscience and, and learning um, invited some neuroscientists to come and present basically the whole day. And he also asked me if I wanted to present. I realised it was um, basically it was a bit of comic relief at the end. Uh, because my background clearly is not in neuroscience. But what I thought I could bring to that was something that I've noticed in education since I've you know, gone through my undergraduate studies and then started teaching and now in my work at the uh, Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority is that teachers are very eager to find any information that they think that will uh, aid them in doing their job. They you know, normally get into the job of teaching because they want to help students learn. So any new information that comes along or any new program that comes along that sounds plausible, they want to grab that with two hands and try and you know, do that with their students. Neuroscience, of course, is, is very popular um, at the moment. There's lots of claims being made about how the brain works. Learning occurs in the brain, so it kind of makes sense. So. I wanted to bring a little bit of scepticism to some of the claims that people make about how the brain works and some of the different programs that um, people try and apply in education. So that's where I felt um, I could contribute to that. So the, the other reason I suppose I'm probably here is um, because uh, of my website um, and book. So this is a book uh, and website that I started with my late father, Jeff Clark. He was an academic in education at Griffith University. And so, of course, through our conversation, we talk a lot about the pseudoscience in education and the fads that go through education that aren't really backed up or justified. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed uh, about the price of my book. It's only $4, which is actually a dollar less than Peter's. Um, <laughs> So because I don't want to undersell Peter, I'm raising the price just for you guys today to $5. Uh, so, and I also would not be offended right now if all of you were just looking down at your phones and ordering it. They'll be fine if you spend five minutes uh, on Amazon. Um, the podcast is free, obviously. There's a first edition of the book available that's free as well as a PDF, so you can go get those for free. And actually, um, blogged a lot of it uh, on my website as well as I was writing the second edition. Uh, what The approach I'm going to take um, really with these different claims, and these are the four different claims I'm going to look at. I'm going to start with something nice and easy, uh, the 10% brain claim, uh, that, you know, that we only use 10% of our brain. Move on to right brain, left brain thinkers, um, looking at brain gym. So who's heard of brain gym? So you've all heard of brain gym. Good. This probably won't be news to you, but um, I still get a kick out of brain gym, especially if you're a bit bored one afternoon, just Google brain gym and teachers, and you can see a lot of, um, uh, what's a polite way of putting it, middle-aged people who aren't necessarily in the prime of their life doing lots of funny poses and stretching. So uh, it's quite entertaining, I find, anyway, but I've got some strange um, fetishes. No, that's not a fetish. Uh, <laughs> The other one I want to look at is learning styles. And learning styles, probably you've all heard of that as well, is something that's pretty much accepted as true um, by most people when they hear about it. Uh, a lot of people don't really do much with it, but they just you'll hear people say, I'm a kinesthetic learner, I'm an auditory learner, things like that. And that's something that's certainly um, accepted in educational circles as being, being something that's true. So I want to investigate that a little bit as well. So I've come up with this little hierarchy in the way that I'm examining these claims, and it's pretty straightforward. Number one, use Google. Number two, ask yourself, is this thing even plausible? Then number three, move on to looking for the empirical evidence. So that's the, the way I'm going to examine uh, these claims today. So before I do, there's a little thing um, 
again, when people say, you know, at work I'm known as kind of the skeptic and, and things like that, and as you guys would all know, when people ask what is a skeptic, people often confuse it with being a cynic or something like that. Uh, so the, the kind of three little things that I, or three versions of skepticism I like to put up are the following. This is what I say being skeptical is really about. It's about saying, asking for evidence before you believe something. Saying, what's the evidence for this? And generally you'll say, I'll, I'll say this evidence is pretty good, so I'm going to provisionally accept it as being true. Number two, admitting to being uncertain when the evidence isn't really there. So that's a really important trait and a very difficult one for most adults um, to have, I think, in particular. And rejecting a claim as unreasonable um, when the evidence isn't there are the, the two main things. I just want to mention the... Um, Second one, being uncertain when the evidence is lacking. And education, as most areas, people are very, because everyone went to school, everyone's happy to generalize their own experience out to the rest of the wider world. And a recent example uh, where I saw this, and it was quite amusing, um, was in the last uh, year and a half in Queensland, we've had a parliamentary inquiry uh, into assessment in senior maths, uh, physics, and chemistry. And throughout that period when the inquiry was getting called and there was lots of debate in the Korea Mail and even the Australian picked it up, there's education reporters have their usual educational gurus that they go to to get comments and quotes. And um, one of the gurus who'd been uh, asked to comment on Queensland, he's a Victorian, um, he might be involved in a review of the curriculum at the moment, not naming names, Kevin Donnelly, um, uh, was more than happy to be quoted in, and again, this definitely, I might get fired, uh, does not reflect the view of my organisation, he's doing a great job. Um, uh, one of these, he was frequently quoted in the Australian and things like that and uh, bloviating about assessment in Queensland and how Queensland's system works and things like that. He was then asked to appear in front of the inquiry and I also, um, as in part of my role, had to, had to go to the inquiry as well and one of the things they make clear to you, they actually make you sign um, some paperwork. You're not under oath like in a court, but basically because whatever you say gets recorded in Hansard, it can be essentially, um, you can face it potentially even prosecution if you give false evidence or if you lie and things like that. So this person, again I haven't actually named names I don't think, did I? No. Um, more than happy to criticise the Queensland system and say this is what's wrong with Queensland in the media. It's funny what happens when they tell you you can get prosecuted if you, if you tell something you're not sure is true because he appeared in front of the inquiry and basically said, don't really know Queensland system, and pretty much said to every question, I'm not really sure. So it's funny when that happens and I almost think we should, it, an approach you can take when you're a sceptic, when people are an opinionated on something is to say to them, just imagine you're actually under oath right now, would you still say you're sure about that? And it may put people put their money down where it, um, where, you know, put their money where their mouth is and really consider how certain are you of that claim you're making? And that's something I think sceptics, we can ask people to focus on and, and say, look, I'm not 100% sure about most of these things, so I'm just going to reserve judgment. It's not sitting on the fence, it's just saying that, that I, I myself don't know enough about it. So it's refreshing to see that you can um, get someone to do that when you threaten them. Uh, okay, so this is the first video I want to look at, and it's a video about the 10% uh, brain myth. So if we can play that now. Fingers crossed. Sorry, I'm oh, missing someone to play. If someone hit play for me, that'd be great. <laughs> this is why, see, normally I, you, know, you can't get good help these days, can you? Well, just ruin the punchline as well. There we go. Research into the brain indicates that th th there's a typical statistic that is used that says that only 10% of our brain is actually used in normal daily life. What do you think the other 90% of the brain is doing or is capable of? Do you think that there are other abilities that people might have that we have not developed? What's your opinion about telekinesis? Now, you've all seen the joke, Ron. Um, <clears throat> By the way, any, I'm going to do the joke. Anyone with telekinesis, raise my hand. <laughs> no, no. I <laughs> uh, can't help that joke. Um, so look, that, that's one of the fallacies we talk about in the book. It's a factoid propagation. And essentially a factoid is something that people take to be true and then it gets propagated throughout. You guys would have all seen that on social media in particular. And, and no doubt you're the person in your Facebook friend group who, when the meme gets passed around, you go, well, actually. Um, uh, and 
that one, you know, it's pretty straightforward if we go to our, um, at least, look, I'll give him some credit. At least he does think the other 90% is doing something. Um, so most people say, well, what do you think the other 90% is doing? And give him a little talk about evolution. Um, but this is what I say to people. If only there was some way of figuring this out, finding his information. So if I go back to my test, we Google it. And this is a pretty straightforward one. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, I'll just run you through the process of how it works. <laughs> so step one. You've got that? Do you, anyone want to take notes? Anyone taking notes? No. Um, and there you go. First links, the brain myth and so on. Now, by the way, has everyone heard of the website Let Me Google That for you? If you haven't, you really need to go have a look at that one and save it as in your favourites. When you get that email or something from someone, um, you can, it sends them a link and runs them through the process of how Google works. It's really effective and um, people really appreciate that when you send them to it as well. <laughs> especially my colleagues. Uh, so this one's pretty, in the hierarchy, this is pretty straightforward. You can Google it, it takes you to some authoritative sources and immediately you can see, hey, look, this is probably a myth um, without doing any further research. So pretty straightforward, that one. I did my little flow chart here to help me um, work it out. Uh, what does the internet say? There's an authoritative source that immediately points out that it's, um, uh, you know, dismisses it so we can give it provisional disbelief. The other factoid um, that I wanted to look at, and it's pretty uh, straightforward as well, fingers crossed it'll come up soon, is um, the left brain, right brain. So most of you are probably familiar with this about you know, being logical and rational when you're left brained and um, artistic and creative when you're um, a right brain thinker. So let's have a look at this one here. We've got another video, if we can hit play on this video. You can all try this. Here is an optical illusion brain test. Are you a right brain thinker or are you a left brain thinker? To check it out, which way is this woman twirling? Now, if she's turning clockwise, well then, you're a right brain thinker. But if she's turning counterclockwise, then you're a left brain thinker. Right brain thinkers are random, intuitive, holistic, synthesizing, subjective, and they look at the whole picture. On the other hand, left brain thinkers are logical, sequential, rational, analytical, objective, and they look at the parts of things. And then there are some people who can see her twirl in either direction. But the big question is, what kind of thinker are you? So I'm going to guess every single person here got her to twirl anti-clockwise, given we're a bunch of sceptics and we're all obviously uh, logical, rational thinkers. Um, <laughs> probably not if I asked. Uh, now look, in terms of this one, when you Google it, it actually, it's not straight away obvious uh, the answer when you, when you Google in left, right brain thinkers, because a lot of people start with the premise or the assumption that it's actually true. So Googling it gives you left brain, you know, you can start reading some of the links and find out more information, but it's not obviously immediate, uh, it's not immediately obvious which way around it is. But the next step really is to ask yourself, is it plausible? So, move forward a bit. That's true. So there actually are two hemispheres. They've done experiments. You know, there's the famous one with the um, man who uh, two halves of his hemispheres, his brain were separated and so on. So it is true. There is, your left brain does certain things, uh, is responsible more for certain things, your right brain uh, more for other certain things. So what people have done is essentially extrapolated that. They have extrapolated that fact and said, okay, well then, if you are more of an intuitive thinker or a more logical thinker, that must mean you're using that side of your brain more. So in terms of plausibility, it's not obviously implausible immediately. But what does the empirical evidence say? So more recently, uh, people have started doing some research into this and they've thought about 
doing functional MRI and things like that and established, look, it's not really true. So I would certainly put myself more on the uh, logical, rational side. I've given my background as a math science teacher and writing a book on fallacies. It's probably not surprising. Uh, but I've got it to swing that's been the wrong way, so there's something wrong with me. Um, just ask people that know me. Uh, so people have started to do this. They're using functional MRI and things like that and they're getting people to do different tests and seeing that it doesn't really make a difference. You know, one side of your brain doesn't light up more doing these particular tests, whether you come across as a right brain or a left brain thinker. So the empirical evidence says, look, it's probably uh, certainly not the case that there are right brain and left brain thinkers. So that classification is certainly a false dichotomy. So at this moment, I think we can give it provisional disbelief. As skeptics here, we probably immediately, it just raises red flags anyway. Um, but, but the evidence is certainly piling up against that as a way of um, viewing um, how brains work. Okay, brain gym. Uh, brain gym, look, it is something that I came across uh, when I was teaching in the UK in the early 2000s um, and it's something that probably most people have, have possibly come across even in Queensland because I've certainly come across teachers who had sworn by it um, uh, to me and then swore at me when I explained to them again that it was a load of rubbish. Um, it is a commercial program started by a guy out of the US and really, um, I'll get, start the video in a second, but one of the key questions I always ask myself in terms of trying to understand a position is what exactly are they claim, saying? What is their specific claim? So if you're trying to understand someone's point of view, it's easy to do the straw man thing or to um, caricature it, and it's certainly easy to do it with Brain Gym. Um, so I won't explain it. I'll let, let um, this little video explain it for you. Invented in California, the Brain Gym technique claims to enhance mental performance. Please may we do my favourite now. Head teacher Sue Smith is a Brain Gym believer. It will certainly help me with my thinking today. She uses it throughout the school day. She's found it calms the pupils and believes it makes their minds more receptive to the lessons ahead. There's an exercise we do called Energy On, where you rub you know, uh, the cheek muscles, and you kind of like relax the tension in the, in, in the jaw and the cheek. If we release the tension in the jaw, that we're releasing problems with the, the temporal mandibular joint, and underneath the temporal mandibular joint, five of the cranial nerves kind of come out and they feed forward into the face, so they improve languaging, but they also feed down into the shoulders and the hips to improve balance. The Brain Gym Manual contains 26 exercises that are meant to realign the mind and body. Here are some of them. Pressing the brain buttons. These are located in the soft tissue under the clavicle to the left and right of the sternum. According to the manual, pressing them activates the brain for sending messages from the right brain hemisphere to the left and an increased flow of electromagnetic energy. It's to be used to help reading. The energy yawn is said to increase circulation to the brain and activates it for increased sensory perception. It's to help reading aloud and creative writing. And hookups connect the electrical circuits of the body and activates the brain for emotional centering. They say it helps students take tests and work at a keyboard. It's one thing at a school is you really try and, especially in a high school, make sure students aren't doing hookups. Um, <laughs> You get in trouble from parents with that one. Uh, so look, that, that's what Brain Gym says. Look, I'm not a, um, a uh, neuroscientist or anything like that, um, but yeah. The, um, is it plausible? I mean, if you didn't know anything, there's some science-y sounding words in there, so you might think it's plausible. Um, again, I, I won't speak to the plausibility of it because I'm not a neuroscientist. Let's let um, Colin Blankmore speak to the, uh, whether brain gym is plausible or not. Um, brain gym relies on uh, a lot on massaging various points on the body, and brain buttons are particularly, what shall we say, amusing. Um, <laughs> I think, I think what you have to do is, is press around here somewhere on the side underneath the clavicle while rubbing the navel with the other hand, central part of the procedure. And this is apparently supposed to change blood flow into the brain and therefore improve the integration of activity in the brain. Well, you know, a bit like trying to 
regulate your central heating system by pressing on the wall of your house because the pipes are behind there. I mean, the notion that pressure here is going to alter blood flow to the brain is just so implausible. And then beyond that, the view that somehow minutely changing overall blood flow is going to alter the particular distribution of activity in the brain and therefore improve learning is just nonsense. So I think Colin's done a pretty good job there of, uh, with his analogy in particular. So really with Brain Gym, what we can say, if it was plausible, we could then go and find some evidence to support it in terms of you know, research and studies, but it's really not even plausible. So at this stage, if something is so implausible, you don't even need to waste any time or effort researching whether it actually works or not, because it, just, it goes against all the un well understood laws of physiology and so on. So for it to actually would be worth investigating, we'd need some um, Hume's razor level evidence of its efficacy, which certainly isn't there, it's just all anecdotal. So at the moment we can give Brain Gym provisional disbelief. Um, look, why prick on Brain Gym? It's harmless, isn't I'll skip over the video, but um, with the students talking about Brain Gym and you know, they're, they're believing in all the things the teachers are telling them. One thing about children is they tend to believe things you tell them. It's really good when you're a parent, but it's obviously, and, and as a teacher, but it's problematic if you're not telling them things. And really what I say as a teacher, our job is to educate students. And as a part of that, you're in a very powerful position. And so, Brain gym, one of the kickbacks of you get, and you guys have all heard this with different um, things as well, it's harmless, isn't it? It's just a bit of mild exercise. And sure, there is, it is mild exercise, breaking up a lesson in between you know, maths and science and English um, with a, you know, five minutes of stretching is probably not a bad thing. But when you get into the explanatory mechanisms that teachers might be telling students, they're telling them the wrong thing. And teachers, even if they don't know that brain gym is a load of rubbish, they're in a position to know, it's their job to find out that what they're doing is actually educationally effective and, and is sound. So it's unethical to teach brain gym even if it is um, itself harmless little exercises students are doing. Okay, now look, it's easy to straw man these things and, and so, and we've had the video from the, the journalist and so on, the person who should defend Brain Gym really should be the founder of Brain Gym. And the second question I ask, you know, what are you saying? So we can be really clear about what he's saying. Why do you believe what you're saying is true? So let's see if there is some good evidence for Brain Gym. Watch this video now. You know, if we can talk to the uh, brains behind uh, Brain Gym, Paul Dennison, who's in. Say in your, in your teacher's manual here, when you talk about hookups that they connect the electrical circuits in the body. What exactly are these electrical circuits, please? Well, I, it's my opinion that uh, we are electrical, that we do have circuits and connections. And uh, when we bring our energy to the midline, to the uh, central point, uh, we are breaking out of the uh, reflex to to go from one side to the other and bring things back to the center where we can be calm and relaxed. It is your and focus, and this is. You, you, you say it is your opinion that we are electrical, Mr. Dennison. Uh, are yes. you medically qualified? No, no, I'm not medically qualified. I'm an educator, but okay. I s study and read, and uh, the. Uh, there are studies to show that we do have electrical acupuncture and other procedures are based on the fact that there are electrical circuits in the body and we are building on the shoulders of these people who have been doing this for thousands of years. Is the fact that you are not medically qualified explanation mm -hmm. enough for statements in this teacher's manual of the kind that processed foods do not contain water, which you know is arrant nonsense? So the, we're interested in helping children and these things work and we explain them the best we can. I've never seen um, someone of that age that flexible and by what that I mean is he's um, managed to get both his feet in his mouth. Uh, uh, <laughs> So 
So I've kind of coined a new fallacy for this. There were so many fallacies in that with, you know, the appeal to tradition and so on. He's begging the question, things like that. Essentially, Brain Jim is one big argument from his own imagination. He sat down there and he's come up with these different exercises for whatever reason, and he's just associated this particular exercise with this particular outcome. It's essentially, you can, you can identify all these specific little fallacies, but fundamentally, if you just sit back and say, mate, you're just making this up. What you're saying is complete horseshit. You've got no evidence for it. You've completely made it up. It's in your own imagination. That's fine. Imagination's a good thing. You know, scientists and so on should have a good imagination, but then you need to back it up with um, evidence and reason and logic. So fundamentally, Brain Gym is an argument from imagination. Last thing I wanted to look at was uh, learning styles. And learning styles, again, most of you have probably come across this, visual, auditory. There's also another one, reading gets thrown in there sometimes and kinesthetic types of learners. And again, in the uh, view of um, uh, letting them explain it, I've got another little quick video to have a look at about learning styles. So what are learning style theories? The idea is that the way that information is organized, or the way that you think about it, matters in how easily you understand or learn it. Suppose you're building a new house and you're trying to give your friend a sense of what it will be like. The visual learner will understand best by seeing the plans, the auditory learner by listening to a description of the house, and kinesthetic learners need to move so your kinesthetic friend might build a model. The theory says that anyone can learn in any of the three ways, so the mostly visual person can still learn auditorily or kinesthetically, and likewise for the mostly kinesthetic person. So it's pretty clear what learning styles say. They're saying that if you have a state of preferred learning style, you'll learn better if you learn in that preferred learning style. So it's a pretty straightforward hypothesis, and it is plausible. Um, when you go on the internet, it's not immediately obvious one way or the other. Um, so then you need to ask yourself, do I really care about this? And if you care about it, then you'll need to do a bit of deeper um, research. Is it plausible? It doesn't immediately contradict any claims um, about how the universe works or how brains work, so it could be plausible that learning styles actually do have an effect on, on learning. So you need to do a bit of research and decide whether the evidence supports the claim or not. So I'll just give a quick example of um, the importance of doing controlled um, uh, experiments, including in education. And just, uh, some speakers have talked about randomised controlled trials beforehand, but um, I just thought I'd throw out an example, that probably a favourite of, of you of, um, uh, of, of sceptics have, and I've got a hypothesis um, that I'll just share with you for a moment. Uh, about wine tasting. Um, now, wine experts, you know, you, you go down to the bottle shop and you've got some wines with you know, three or four stars, that's fantastic. Um, an experiment that was done uh, a, a few, probably back in the beginning of the 2000s, asked a bunch of wine experts to taste um, some white and red wine. What they didn't know was that the um, red wine was actually white wine with red food colouring in it. 57 experts tried this red wine, which was actually white wine with red food colouring in it, but none of them twigged that it was white wine. They all described it as you would describe red wine. That's not to say necessarily my hypothesis is confirmed, it's some evidence in that direction. Um, but what it does show you, when you have a perception, and then those, you'll filter all your beliefs in to make that perception um, become reality, i.e. wine experts are people, and we all do that. We're all aware of the placebo effect, and it has an effect in education as well. When teachers try different educational programs, if there's no controlled experiments done on it, you've invested money and time in this particular program, you're gonna have anecdotal evidence that's saying that this is working. We're all invested in those kinds of things. So how would you do a randomised controlled trial with um, something like learning styles? Well again, you get your sample population, you randomise it, one group doesn't get the intervention, the other does, and then you compare the outcomes when you do some kind of assessment, you know, for example, a test or something like that. So have there been randomised control trials for um, learning styles? Not really, but if we were doing it for, there's been a few, and we'll talk about them in a moment. If you were doing it, how would you do it? You would assess your students, so you'd get a bunch of students and assess them for whether they you know, prefer to be kinesthetic or auditory or um, uh, visual learners. You then randomise them, so you put them in their different groups of different types of learners. Um, they're, they're randomly assigned to, so some, some get, get to learn in their preferred learning style, some don't. You then assess them, so they all take the same assessment, the same type of test, 
And then you say to yourself, well, what would we expect to see? Well, if learning styles, if learning in your preferred learning style means you will learn better, you'd expect to see those who learn with their preferred learning styles perform statistically significantly better than those who don't. And that's what you would see. So how, how, has, it been, how has it been done in, in, in um, research? Back in 2009, um, it's the American uh, Association for Psych um, Psychological Science. They basically commission a different paper every year, a big uh, meta-analysis with people who, aren't, who are experts in the field in general looking at an area of research that they don't, they don't research themselves. So they removed some of that bias. And they looked at learning styles in 2009. And what they found, there was a lot of literature on learning styles. They surveyed over 50 different papers, but not too many of them tested that specific hypothesis. A lot of them actually started with the presumption that that hypothesis is true. A lot of research in education is um, case studies and anecdotal observational studies. So the, the problem there is they, you immediately introduce the observer bias as soon as you do that. The ones that um, did test the hypothesis, were negative. There was one that showed a slight positive thing, but they thought the methodology was quite flawed. So again, not too many did test it, but when the uh, controls got tightened up and we actually get some randomised controlled uh, studies that found that learning styles, that learning in your preferred learning style doesn't mean you're going to learn something particularly um, or better than people who learn in another style. So in terms of our testing, empirical evidence now, um, we can say that learning styles at the moment, we're going to give them provisional disbelief because the evidence doesn't support the claim at the moment. More research might be done and show in some areas it does work, but at the moment we give it provisional disbelief. It also brings to the fact that with any kind of research, we need to weigh up the cost-benefit because if teachers are spending an inordinate amount of time preparing a particular auditory lesson for some students, a visual lesson for some, a kinesthetic for others, they're investing a lot of time and you need to therefore guarantee that that's going to have a really good outcome if you're going to do that because there are things in education we know that do work. So that's what teachers should be focused on. And so in learning styles in particular, if they're doing that, they're wasting their time and, and in, they're spending time on something that doesn't actually work or is very unlikely to work. So in terms of the test again, number one, Google it. Number two, is it plausible? Number three, what does the evidence say? And it really depends on the, the um, level of interest you have as well. And 10% brain claim and all those other myths, pretty straightforward with Googling it. Ask yourself, is it plausible? And then look for some of the evidence. Uh, on my website, I've put some of the links to uh, these, these things and the research that's behind it. So if you're interested in that, um, you can go along there um, to, to grab further information and also to buy a copy of my book, which is $1 cheaper than Peter's. Um, uh, <laughs> Buy both of them, they're both cheap. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Theo. Um, any questions for Theo? I'll use the mic. Use the mic, please. Can you turn the mic on, mate? It is on. Yes, please. Check, check, check one, two. Hi, I'm Simon, I'm a colleague, I work as a teacher here in Queensland, and I'm interested to know what, if, if you're aware of, any action that's being taken by the department to promote sceptical attitudes to professional developers, people coming into schools, which could increasingly happen as we move towards independent public schools, uh, what's being done or being discussed about uh, perhaps protecting schools from being hit by the shysters who come along and charge a school to uh, provide PD when it's not based in empirical fact. Yeah, sure. Um, I, as I preface it, I work for the Central Authority but not the Department of Education. Um, uh, and again, a lot of those things are really school decisions, so it's actually the school themselves will choose what the PD is and so on. Um, certainly my experience has been um, uh, most, most professional development will be around um, things to do with the curriculum and things like that um, that are run by you know, organisations such as us or associations. Um, but yeah, there is certainly examples of that happening, mm. um, but it's, uh, generally it's a school level decision. And so uh, if something was raised with the department, they could go and investigate it. So we get, you know, things like creationism being taught in some schools and that, that will get investigated. Um, but it's really a, a, a decision that happens at the school level. So yeah, it's up to teachers to, to raise that as an issue at their own school, really, yeah. Any further questions? Oh yeah. 
I'd have to Google it for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. About 40 years ago, they brought in some called something called Rhymes or Fuse and Air, which is extremely helpful for people who had difficulty visualising numbers. About 10 years later, they seem to scrap that. Now, is there any logic behind this? Oh look, uh, education is prone to fa uh, fads for sure. Uh, look, I'm obviously a bit young for that one for me to know that one specifically. Um, but yeah, it is prone. And look, you know, uh, programs come in, money gets spent, and so on. Education is still a long way behind, say, medicine in terms of the um, rigor that's applied to the things that get done. Um, medicine, you know, has particular ways of training people um, and of what's generally accepted as this will work or this procedure will work. Education is still a long way behind um, that, uh, sadly, yeah. Anyone further question up there? Is there any specific methodology that you're potentially on the fence on that you wish there was more research about that it you know, could be useful, actually useful in schools? Oh, look, there's, there's plenty of good um, uh, research that's very targeted. So the best research tends to be quite narrow. So there's people doing research in science education about um, teaching concepts in particular ways in um, maths and numeracy about um, uh, additive thinking, multiplicative thinking, and so on. But there's no, generally speaking, no coherent approach um, to professional learning uh, anywhere, really. Uh, some countries do it better than others. Um, the use of feedback with students is something that, that um, uh, is defi definitely works. And again, there's no um, accredited body or anything like that that says this is what is the good stuff to learn and this is what everyone should be learning in the same way that they say is in medicine. Um, if, if, if you go out of your way as a teacher to go to conferences and things like that, you'll find all the good stuff. Um, I was at the Maths Teachers Conference two weeks ago up in um, Townsville. There's some fantastic uh, research going on there um, well, with maths figure, education it's the maths academics. Department that has the great research, right? Sorry. Go figure. It's the maths department that has the great research, right? Yeah. Well, I, actually, no. I mean, this was this was um, the. Um, uh, someone from, say, the University of Melbourne in maths mm -hmm. education and her research is, is, seems quite credible and quite um, uh, useful. But again, getting it out to the right people and the right teachers is a bit more challenging, yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you.